Good morning or good afternoon, good evening. This is Daryl Baskin. Uh, this is a talk entitled OCT and Epiretinal Membranes that I gave last night to a group of community eye providers and I wanted to make it available to folks online if, if desired. I have no relevant financial disclosures and uh, this is a photo taken of me and my family uh, at our house in Africa where we lived at the time. This is a little over four years ago. Uh, we were there for a short period of time, and uh, one day hope, we hope to return, or I hope to return. I don't know about all my kids. Uh, anyway, while I was there, I was able to uh, had the great privilege to work with a fantastic eye doctor, and we helped co-found uh, Burundi's first chemotherapy program for kids with retinoblastoma. We'd had a 100% mortality rate despite a nucleation. Um, all these kids are presenting very late, of course, group B or worse, orbital retinoblastoma, and uh, the mortality rate after initiating our program went down um, by 50% um, the, just the first year alone. And this program is still going on. I'm very proud of it and all the people who work on it daily. So uh, this talk is about epiretinal membranes, uh, a topic near and dear to my heart. We're going to not have any diagnostic dilemmas here. We're going to talk about management, answer five questions posed by question. Post, excuse me, post by patients of mine. So uh, this is a 66-year-old uh, male Boeing retiree who has this epiretinal membrane that you can see that has somewhat irregular uh, uh, contours in its shape. You can see some retinal striae and a uh, little hemorrhage as well in the inferior nasal macula. Vision of 2020. And uh, here's his epiretinal membrane on OCT. You can see the hyperreflective line, retinal fold, cystoid macular edema, and uh, no disruption of his lipsoid zone or ELM or cost for that matter, cone outer segment tips. His question to me was, how common is an epiretinal membrane? So to answer that question, uh, the best study I've seen recently is uh, an OCT-based study, not a color fundus photo study. It's out of the Beaver Dam Eye study, a longitudinal um, study that out of Wisconsin that's basically looking at nearly 100, nearly 99% white people. Um, and so for folks over 62, a third of them have an epiretinal membrane. And that number, if you divide it by age, is even higher in the over 70, 75 and over group, 53%. So to answer his question, epiretinal membranes are very common, probably one of the most common retinal findings amongst uh, the U.S. population over that age um, of 63. So this photo was actually taken in 2020. I started seeing it two years prior when he didn't have an epiretinal membrane for flashes and floaters. He did have a cataract. He went to go have cataract surgery, and then he came back with flashes and floaters in the fellow eye, but his right eye, asymptomatic, had this epiretinal membrane. And even though I showed him the photo, he still <laughs> didn't think there was a problem, and I didn't convince him otherwise. He did have a small tear in that right eye, which is probably what contributed to his uh, irregularly shaped epiretinal membrane. Um, so we did the laser retina pexy, continued to follow him. His vision declined a little bit, just a couple of letters, but he had no metamorphopsia, didn't have any diplopia, no macropsia. So I said, all right, well, he was happy, I was happy. We didn't do surgery and uh, he moved on to another state. So hopefully he continues to do well. Next patient, 64 year old male retiree, avid woodworker, didn't notice a problem until uh, the, uh, the referring doctor had him cover up his fellow eye. And then he said, oh, it is a little blurry in there, it's 2040. He has this epiretinal membrane that's caused some loss of his foveal pit in his right eye. And uh, his question is, how bad is my epiretinal membrane? So to answer that question, uh, I like to look at this Govetto staging system. This is my favorite ERM classification system. Stage one, it's pretty simple stuff. Stage one is an epiretinal membrane that does not change the foveal contour. Stage two is you lose the foveal pit. He also, this uh, particular instance also has a cotton ball sign in the um, disrupting sort of the lipsoid zone of external limiting membrane. That's not necessarily part of the staging. By the way, cystoid macular edema does not affect the uh, stage staging in this particular system. Uh, and then this one, stage three, is characterized by the continuous ectopic foveal inner layer. So you'll notice right where his foveal should be, we not only have loss of that foveal contour, we now, we now have dragging of the internuclear layer, the inner plexiform layer across the center of the fovea. And of course, you need a fovea-centered OCT to confirm this. If you're off center by a little bit, you might overcall this stage. Stage four is a disruption of the um, retinal layers, so outer, inner, etc. And it, this same paper from Govetto uh, took about 180 of uh, uh, their eyes, retrospectively, uh, categorized them into these stages. And you could see the cystoid macular edema prevalence increased with increasing stage. Ellipsoid zone disruption increased with increasing stage and vision worsened with increasing stage. 
So how bad is his ERM? Well, it's a stage two on a scale of one to four. So let me show you some of his pictures. That's that first one again. Uh, I saw him again after that, didn't put the photo here uh, for uh, lack of space, and then it hadn't really changed very much, and I said, Falk, come back when you're bothered by this. And so he did come back uh, in 2020. He had a stage three with cystoid macular edema, and now he also has some subretinal fluid, and I want you to see on his autofluorescence, this is really interesting. You can see where his venules used to be based on these hyperautofluorescent lines that we now know represent the original location of uh, blood vessels. We talk about this a lot in uh, pneumatic retinopexy and retinal detachment with MAC off, and displacement, etc. But in his case, it, it highlights the tangential nature of the traction induced by the epiretinal membrane. He had vitrectomy. He did want vitrectomy at this time. And this is a typical appearance for my post-op patients. This is about a year after surgery. He's 20-20, very happy, but you can see he still has a continuous ectopic foveal inner layers going right there in the center. Okay, on to the next patient. 67-year-old female retiree. Loves horseback riding. She had a successful epiretinal membrane peel on her fellow eye in 2013. This is her OCT, and you can see that she's got a stage two. She also has vitreopapillary attachment, and she wants to know, is this going to get any worse? Do I have to do something about this? So to answer that question, um, I found two studies that backed up sort of my pet theory that vitreopapillary attachment may induce the progression of an epiretinal membrane. Again, not really confirmed in a prospective study, but here's what we got retrospectively. 24 months of follow-up natural history of epiretinal membrane. This is out of Korea. 62 eyes. Over three quarters were stable uh, ERMs, but almost 20% progressed. And of those 20%, about half of them had vision loss accompanied by that progression. Again, that progression was defined by their study, uh, which isn't that important to go into at this point. And then if you look, if you divided those... All their patients have a complete PVD and uh, a lack of a complete PVD. 52 had a complete PVD at the time of entry. Uh, around 4% of those patients progressed with their epiretinal membrane as opposed to 4 out of 10 or 40% that did not have a complete PVD had some epiretinal membrane progression. Next study, this one's a little bit different. This is uh, from Kwan et al. Again, from uh, Korea, this is a retrospective study looking at patients that had cataract surgery and whether they had a new onset or progression of their epiretinal membrane after cataract surgery. Bigger study, 813 eyes. Um, no PVD was found in 210 eyes. Uh, 313 eyes had a partial PVD, and nearly 300 had a full PVD. So if you looked at those that had no PVD, there's only a new onset or progression in 3.3%. A very similar percentage for a full PVD, but those that have partial PVD, which included vitreomacular traction and vitreomacular adhesion, 13.7, um, nearly 14% progressed or had a new onset. And there's the, the numbers there for you. So to answer her question, will it get worse? Mm, in my experience, it could. But she was not particularly bothered by her symptoms at this point, and she chose to observe. Here's her photo when she first came in in 2017. You see the VPA, vitreopapillary attachment. A few months later, not a lot of difference. Vision's perhaps a letter worse. A um, couple letters worse vision here, but now we went from stage two to stage three. You see the ectopic foveal inner layers there, right in the center of the fovea. I got them highlighted. And uh, a few months after that, her vision was had declined a little bit more. And now she's ready for surgery. And again, she still has that stage three. We don't see uh, uh, a reverse progression in these cases, or I haven't yet. So after surgery, just a month later, a surprising outcome anatomically, and maybe it's because we caught it relatively quickly when she went from stage two to stage three, I don't know. Uh, but she did actually lose those continuous ectopic foveal inner layers. Again, not a common surgical outcome for me in terms of that improvement in anatomy to that degree, but her vision's quite a bit better and uh, she's not followed up with me since. I don't know if that's pandemic related or she just doesn't want to stop riding horses and come into clinic. So anyway, next patient, 52 year old surgeon, who's, <laughs> which bothers me a little bit. He's only mildly bothered by his vision. He says he's having a little bit of difficulty with 2100 vision operating under a microscope. So uh, I, I suppose he's, uh, his brain is just uh, blocking out the, the image from this side. I don't know. But um, his question was, well, how much will my vision improve if I have surgery? So there's a lot of predictors of post-op visual acuity. Um, if you have severe uh, 
disorganization of the retinal inner layers, you, you, that's a predictor of worse final visual acuity. If you start out with better vision, you end up with better vision. If you have uh, good cone outer segment tips integrity and good ellipsoid zone, and um, something that's harder to measure uh, for the clinician is a longer photoreceptor outer segment length, that all leads to better final visual acuity. Worse pre-op vision leads to greater visual gain because you have more room to grow, if you will. And then these other uh, factors also lead to greater visual acuity gain. And the pseudophakia is probably more factor. The, uh, a couple of these studies had a shorter follow-up, but not everybody had cataract surgery in the phakia group. So, And they developed a cataract, as you know, 90% of them will after the age of 50 within two years after retina surgery. Um, and then a thicker internuclear layer was correlated with worse metamorphopsia. So to answer his question, well, you know, it's a long, detailed discussion, but based on his OCT parameters and his starting vision, I thought he would have a lot of room to improve. So I gave him a rough estimate. This is how he looked pre-op. This is a few years later. This is actually a patient that saw me when I was active duty military and followed me afterwards. You can see on his IR photo, the infrared photo over to the left, a lot less dragging now, but there still is some, um, probably some uh, displacement and he still has con continuous ectopic foveal inner layers, but his vision's great and he's very happy. Last patient, retired nurse, 64 years old, who'd been followed for four years by a retina doctor in the state she previously lived in, just moved to the Texas Hill Country. And uh, the, I don't, we don't know the details, but it, uh, it appears that the retina doctor there was waiting for her vision to drop below a certain threshold, and she was 20, 30 plus. Now she did have double vision uh, at the time when she came and saw us, and she had a loss of depth perception. So in, in some regards, kind of an advanced presentation, you could see she has um, stage three to maybe even stage four uh, epiretinal membrane. And her question was, well, how do we decide when it's time to operate? Because I've been waiting for the vision to drop. So um, these are some factors that are related to decision to pursue surgery. This is basically a question that we put out very informal survey. This is not real data. Uh, we just asked our investigators at DRCR Retina, what was the most important factor or to rank the factors when deciding to pursue surgery? And as you might guess, uh, uh, the plurality of votes for the primary factor went to visual acuity, but well over half of our investigators said that um, something besides visual acuity is the most important factor, such as a level of annoyance. How much is the patient bothered by it? Um, metamorphopsia was a strong number two or three. Macropsy and diplopia were not major decision makers um, for the investigators, and that might be due to the fact that some, some people believe that by the time those symptoms arise, the the epiretinal membrane uh, is quite progressed and uh, the, the outcomes after surgery don't always improve macropsy or diplopia very much, especially when you think about diplopia, the subset being that central peripheral rivalry, otherwise known as the dragged fovea diplopia syndrome. Surgery, uh, we can't redrag or iron out or steam the retina and get it back to the way that it was when, you were, when the patient was born. So um, that, that dragging sometimes never fully goes away. In fact, most of the time it does not. So how do we decide? Well, we really need a large multi-center prospective randomized control trial to answer that question. So uh, one of my partners operated on her in 2016. Uh, she had a good anatomical outcome. Vision was a little bit worse uh, a month after surgery. She did have a cataract uh, within a few months, so her vision did drop. And then she had cataract surgery later that year. Moving on to 2017, her vision's 2025 plus two, but she still has that continuous ectopic foveal inner layers. Still very bothered by distortion, loss of depth perception. And, uh, every time this patient comes in, and I would probably do the same thing, um, she describes her symptoms for 10 or 15 minutes um, and is very, very bothered by them and, and, and would like to know what can be done. And unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done. She did have a PCO, so we, uh, I recommended a YAG, and that did improve her visual, visual acuity, but she is still bothered by those symptoms. and. It just highlights the fact that uh, this is, we don't know enough about epiretinal membranes and uh, maybe earlier surgery would have been a better option for her. So key, key points, key takeaways, epiretinal membranes are very prevalent, seen in more than a third of Medicare age folks. Uh, Gavetto staging system is awesome and may become a more useful measure in the future. It doesn't take into account cystoid macular edema or vitreous status, still very useful. A partial PVD may be a risk factor for epiretinal membrane progression. There are many OCT biomarkers in addition to visual acuity that help us assist in predicting their post-operative visual function. Of course, no guarantees are ever made. And we really need a large multi-center prospective randomized control trial to address this, the optimal timing of intervention, and even to look at natural uh, history progression. And, and perhaps that will be done by the DRCR retina one day. 
Uh, these are some of my references. There's a lot. And uh, this is my family during the winter storm. Thankfully, we were uh, not hit by that as hard as a lot of other folks in the Hill Country. And so thank you very much for your time. I hope you have a great day.